uh, wanted to take this opportunity to kind of re reiterate our updates and where we're putting them. We are updating, uh, you should hopefully be all getting our global messages that we're putting out. Uh, we did put a global out specifically for uh, our physical speech and occupational therapy providers, I believe last week. Uh, I will share that now so you can all view. <clears throat> So the message was sent out on March 25th. We wanted to clarify that uh, effective immediately, and this was all backdated to, I believe, March 16th, um, and will go on for as long as the uh, emergency period exists. Right now, we have all these codes set up to go through the end of April, and we'll continue to monitor it. My guess is that we'll, have, we'll need to extend it um, based on the uh, CDC guidance recently. Um, but we have them set up in the system to allow for the GT modifier, for this particular provider group to be built with uh, not all PT and OTST services, but some. Uh, we specifically identified uh, CPT 97110, 97530-7535. Uh, those can be submitted with a GT modifier. So you would submit as you normally do, just add that modifier to it and it should uh, reimburse through the system. I will say that we've had to uh, kind of, make a lot of modifications to MMIS and the payment system over the last uh, few weeks. So be patient with us. If you get a denial, just reach out to our provider services helpline uh, at the number mentioned there and uh, let them know that the claim is denied. That way we can fix the system for everyone. Um, we are asking providers in your internal policies and procedures to create some sort of uh, internal guiding policy around the use of uh, telehealth and uh, services. And that way you can uh, refer to that internal policy in your clinical documentation and your notes. So that way, if uh, when we're auditing a year or two now, I know that we'll, we will all remember the emergency period and we'll audit accordingly. But that way we just know that the providers um, are, are, are being more, more conscious and intentional about the use of telehealth and ensuring that their staff are appropriately trained on its use. Um, we really uh, just want to and to get this message out there and let you all know uh, that we are trying our best to respond to the crisis by opening up as far as we can, as far as we deem appropriate for the PTO, TNST services. Um, at this time, we're happy to open it up for questions. There is a, and I see a couple of coming in. There are, and if you aren't familiar with the platform, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we prefer that questions come through that form rather than the chat box so that we can all view and answer appropriately. Uh, I will say that we have other uh, healthcare authority staff online who are going to assist Mel and I with responding to questions. That would be Karen Beam and uh, Jacqueline Mullen, and we'll go to the Q&A. So the first one is, will you allow provision of extensions of expiring authorizations to continue to provide services for client expiring during this time? Um, I will refer to Jacqueline for that. I know that they have uh, adjusted PA requirements. We haven't completely done away with prior authorization, but we have adjusted those as well as the prescription timeframes. And I'll let Jacqueline respond to that. Okay, thank you, Trailer. I was actually getting ready to type an answer, but Trailer is way too fast for me. <laughs> so for that, Cindy, if you could let us know as to which authorizations you are referring to, which services, because there are some services that we are just automatically extending the authorizations on. So if you could just let me know which ones you're referring to, that way we can get the answers for you. Thank you. It looks like a follow-up question uh, specifically referring to uh, OT and PT, I believe. Okay, let's see. Yes, so from Rebecca. Rebecca, this has been discussed with our, um, the contract therapists that we have, and they, along with the OHCA, had decided that we just would not open that aspect. But if you have any more specific examples or reasons why you think this should be open, if, if you will, please reach out to me and let me know. My direct email is J-A-C-L-Y-N, period, Mullen, M-U-L-L-E-N, at okhca.org. 
And then that way, if there is some extenuating circumstances that you feel should allow for telehealth, I can run that by our contract therapist and we can take a look at that. Thank you, Rebecca, for asking. Thanks, Jacqueline. I see several questions have common themes and they're around the ability to provide evaluations and reevaluations since we're not allowing that uh, to be provided by telehealth. Uh, how will we ensure coverage of these services um, moving forward in this time uh, where we can't do in-person face-to-face? Yeah, and you know, Cindy, that is a, it is a very good question. When we initially set out and put that global out, I think as we all assumed, <laughs> this stay in place, social distancing, would not have would not go on for too very long, I think. Or maybe we were all just hopeful. Well, and since like Trailer had mentioned that we may be having to go further than April 30th on a lot of this telehealth stuff. Um, what I can do is I can check and just double check with the contract therapist and with the OHCA executive staff and just see if this is something that because it looks like this is going to continue for a while, see if there is something else that we might be able to do. Um, but Cindy, also, if you would reach out to me on my email address, that way I have a direct line to you, um, we can communicate back and forth with that. Thank you for that question. Thanks, Jacqueline. And I'll, I'll, I'll follow up as well that um, just to let you know that we are um, recording today's session and that we will have a list of all the questions presented and we'll do our best to get this in writing and post to our COVID-19 response website, uh, which is a good time to uh, let you know that that site is okhca.org slash COVID-19. Um, we have a lot of great resources out there as well as a detailed listing of the responses that the agency has taken in response to the, the, uh, the public health emergency. Uh, Jacqueline, I also saw a question about if you're issuing a new PA, do they need to put the GT modifier in the PA request? Um, I do know that in PAs that we've had to, that were in the system currently, that we've been able to modify those on our end, but do they need to put the GT in, the, in an initial request moving forward? So that has been brought up, and what we have what my unit has worked out with uh, specific providers is on the brand new request. If it's something, go ahead and put the GT modifier on there. And then when it comes into the system, we will take a look at it and determine whether that's something that across the board we're allowing to reimburse with telehealth or if that's something that we won't. And so either way, we will, through the PA system, let you know if that's something that we will allow. I also see a question about speech therapy, specifically around uh, 92507. Uh, I do remember seeing correspondence between us about PA modifications uh, and changes for speech. Did we add CPT codes that would be billable with a GT modifier as well? So there have already been, there are five speech CPT codes that are, that have already been approved for teletherapy. And those are actually on our website under medical authorization unit and under speech therapy, the PTOT speech therapy. And when you click down through there, there's a section for teletherapy with speech and it actually pulls up those five codes. And I am scrambling to see if I can find them real quick to let to say it. But as I'm sure many people are having issues with their internet, it's trying to go very slow today. But there are specific ones that speech has already, we've allowed in the past. But let me 
see if that's one of them. Okay, and, and we can definitely respond to that question uh, in writing uh, following this meeting, uh, giving a direct link to those telehealth services currently reimbursable for speech uh, through telehealth. Let's see. One from Stephanie Valentine's uh, speech authorizations are coming back with teletherapy and direct therapy units separately. However, OT and PT auths are not. Is this going to change? Um, could you read that again, trailer? I'm sorry, I can't. Sure. I don't seem to have that on here. No problem. Yeah, speech fine. therapy authorizations are coming back with teletherapy and direct therapy units separately. However, OT and PT odds are not. Is this going to change? My guess is that it's because it already had a process in place for speech since we had previously covered codes for telehealth. Yes, that's, that's my take on this also, because those were already implemented, I want to say a few years ago even. And now with the OT and PT off aspect, that I'm not sure of. I will look into that. And like Trailer had mentioned, we I will put in writing the answer to that question. Uh, there's a question from Sally Stover. Will you be extending current prior authorizations for speech as well? So with the speech PAs, we are, the extension, that's not something that we're going to be doing automatically. That, we decided that even though some primary care practitioners are maybe not seeing patients for well child visits or for really anything outside of an illness, we decided that the therapist could still contact the PCP, whether it be a fax, phone call, email, however it is that you can do that securely, and asking for either just an extension on the current script or even a new one if the PCP excuse me, feels comfortable just going ahead and renewing for however many months to a year. So we feel at this time that there's still that ability to reach out and communicate with the PCP to obtain that. And so what we've seen so far is a lot of them are just extending. So they're just saying, okay, yes, even though I haven't seen patient A, um, I will extend the script or the order, the physician order through June or something like that. And so because of that ability that's still there, we have decided not to do any extensions on our end at this time. Thanks, Jacqueline. I think that adds us, uh, the next question kind of touches on that as well, uh, asking about uh, typically there needs to be information from a recent well child visit from the PCP for the prior authorization. Um, I do have a, a note here that on the PA request, we're not requiring it that it necessarily be from a well child visit as usual, but that we do need uh, some recent, uh, let's see, documentation from the PCP that would be current as far as our case notes go in order to get the PA extended. Is that correct? Yes. So that is, we were aware about the possibility of this coming up. And so, yes, what our speech therapist decided is that whatever your most recent progress note that you can obtain from the PCP. So if that was even a year ago or so, we are reviewing those on a case-by-case -case basis just because we do understand that there is a potential that you will not have a very current one. So all we request is that you just send in the most current one that you have available to you. And we will review that on a case-by-case -case basis. Let's see, there's code-specific 
questions. Uh, are you covering CPT code 92507? I'll share the screen again just so we have the global up. So right now the codes that we're covering for PT and OT are 97110, 97535. Yeah, and that's one of the, I think that is a, let's see. I know that one was brought up. I think last week in a discussion, and I think at that point we had decided to just leave as is. Um, but that's also something that I can, not can, I will, I will double check and respond back in writing to that particular question. We've also received a couple of questions on uh, the difference between the providers for uh, children and adolescents versus adult. Um, I will say it's been my assumption that when we're talking about codes that are opening up, even though they are in two different settings, um, that we would apply it to both settings. Is that correct, Jacqueline and Karen? So on the PA side, yes. But the key is though, is whatever we currently have open, and when I say open, I mean you know requiring a PA, but that it is open in our system to pay if the PA is appropriate, medically appropriate. If it is strictly for children only, then that will be, then that's just, that will not change. But if it's something, a code that we cover both for children and adults, then yes, none of that has changed. Everything is still age specific where it's already been age specific. Thank you. So we have a question about school-based OTPT and speech provided through telehealth and whether or not that's reimbursed by Medicaid. I will say that we have we had a meeting with the State Department of Education last week, as well as several internal OHCA staff, and we're looking to mirror um, wherever we add the GT modifier on the Title 19 Sooner Care side, uh, the State Department of Education uh, would like for them to be able to be provided through their contractors as well. Looking through questions. Some of these I think we've answered through other answers. What do providers do when private insurance wants us to use G codes, but OH is secondary and our offs are for CPT codes? How do we file with OHCA for secondary payment? That's a good question. Melody, have we run into that before in our, our standard GT billing? I believe so. I, I will have to go back and check. Um, if it uh, if you file electronically, it may be a little different way to file with us than if you happen to drop that to paper. I need to follow up with our TPL team and we'll put something out in writing. Okay. There's a question on whether we will accept a referral from a physician who does a telehealth well child check. Uh, and I will say to that, I know we've only opened specific E&M codes that can be done um, by telehealth and telephonic service. But if you meet those criteria, Jacqueline and or Karen, would we allow that um, as documentation? So from a PA standpoint, yes. Yeah. If you feel like performing a well child check via telehealth, knowing that there are a few aspects of that that you will be unable to perform. Um, from a PA standpoint, as long as you have the information in the notes, the progress notes that we need, then for us, it's not going to matter if you if it was face to face or through telehealth. But I just, you know, that's just from a PA standpoint. Now. For other aspects of care, I'm not sure about the well child check through telehealth. Right, and I, I would add too, we would, we would rely on the physician uh, to determine the appropriateness and the effectiveness of a face-to-face -face telehealth visit in, the, in, that, in that regard, I would, I would think. 
Yes. There's a question Thank for uh, for a Zoom or FaceTime visit. Do we check that the child is present? Um, so I would refer individuals to our telehealth uh, policy. That's in our policy. It's located at 30-3-27. Uh, it gives you all the parameters and guidelines for telehealth. Most, if not all, of the requirements there will still be uh, required. The only thing that's different is the codes that we're actually opening up. And then in some limited circumstances, we're allowing for telephonic. Um, so I would, I would familiarize myself with those if this is your first time providing telehealth services for Sooner Care to make sure that, uh, that you're meeting that. And for children, we do require that a parent present the child for the service. And so that can be that the parent is actually with the child, uh, although they don't have to be with them at, during the session. Um, and then that we would, uh, or it could be that provider called parent, text parent, got uh, approval for the telehealth service for that session. Um, and also, I will also kind of add a note too, we didn't mention this earlier, but outside of the emergency period, the provider needs to ensure that they're using a HIPAA compliant platform to provide the telehealth service. So if you're new to telehealth, I will say that outside of extraordinary circumstances like this, you have to make sure that you're using one of those platforms. Um, of which time and non-healthcare related Zoom platforms would not be. However, the feds and the agency responsible for enforcing HIPAA compliance has said during the emergency period, use whatever face-to-face um, -face, uh, video conferencing system you have available to you and they will not enforce those sections of HIPAA during the emergency period. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there in terms of what you're, what we're allowing today by way of platform will not necessarily be true after the emergency period. I noticed there's several questions about the difference in the way hospitals submit claims using a UB and how those will uh, be impacted by this. We will get in writing, uh, again, a lot of good questions. We'll get those in writing because we'll need to touch base with some of our claims folks that aren't currently on the chat um, and we'll get those posted for you. And again, it'll be our intent to post this live meeting recording as well as our response to Q&A uh, to our COVID-19 website. I did, if you look in the answered section of the Q&A, I did list that website. It's okhca.org slash COVID19. See, so there's a question about uh, platforms. Using a HIPAA compliant platform, it's sometimes the parents have difficulty with the technology. If the parent requests and give permission, can we use FaceTime or other less HIPAA compliant? Yes, but only during the emergency period. So how does this relate to the G0151 codes for DDSD? Um, we will look into that. I will say that we have been working with our partners at the Department of Human Services and uh, Melody and I actually have a Zoom call with them right after this one at one to go through um, their flexibilities regarding providers and providers of services for the various uh, home and community-based services. Uh, so we'll get that responded to you in writing as well. Again, I would, I would like to reiterate too that if there's some codes that, we, that you see that we haven't covered, um, it would be helpful for, uh, for us when we're making the request to us moving forward to cover them. If you could also uh, kind of give your clinical rationale for how these codes could be effectively provided uh, by telehealth, uh, any evidence uh, or research that you have to support that would be super helpful to, to our staff. Uh, again, we. We have most of those resources available to us, uh, but we would like to hear from the providers as well as to how you can make that accommodation and how it would still be appropriate and effective in providing that service uh, by technology. Hey, trailer. This yes. is Jacqueline. Hey, I also wanted to let everyone know that in addition to my email address, they could also reach out to just the MAU administrative email address because that way other people are also looking at that, or even our therapies email address. The MAU email is maueadmin, 
A D M I N at O K H C A dot org. Then our therapy admin is therapy admin easy, at okhca.org. So if you have a therapy specific question that you find ends up not getting answered from this Zoom meeting or even whenever we respond in writing, you could reach out to either of those email addresses and someone could quickly respond to you with an answer. So I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of those two addresses, email addresses. Thank you, Traylon. Thank you. So there's a question about school bay. School bay speech services are being re reimbursed. After our conversation, Okay, so the State Department of Ed, they should be. What I will say, though, is we will check the system to make sure it's actually set up in the back end uh, to process. With uh, a question about consent and presentation of the child, a minor child. So with the parent presenting a child for treatment for consent, does this apply as far as getting a verbal consent for treatment overall versus a signed consent? Um, so I will add that we don't require a separate consent for telehealth. The overriding consent to provide the service is what's important there. Um, the presentation of the child is simply a, an acknowledgement from the parent that they are presenting their child for a service for that individual service that day. So you don't have to receive a separate uh, consent for that day or even to provide it by telehealth, just that the, uh, the parent is present, presenting them for that telehealth session that day. There's a question, uh, and Jacqueline says, I don't believe you have specifically answered this question about approving PAs for teletherapy off of an eval done via teletherapy for PTOT. You have said it's not going to be reimbursed, but will the PA be approved? Um, so I believe what I heard earlier is if, if the evaluation, let's see. So if we don't reimburse for the eval by telehealth, will we approve a PA for the, the service? I believe is the question there. Okay, sorry about that. I was answering, I'm typing out on another one. Um, so that particular question, that got brought up to last week, I think it was. And our response to that is, when you submit the prior authorization and you submit the required documents, as long as within those required documents has what we need, to show medical necessity for the service you are requesting, then for us, it's, I don't wanna say it doesn't matter whether it's face-to-face -face or teletherapy. Um, so don't think I'm saying that, um, but as long as we have the information in our records from you that really clearly show the medical necessity for that particular service, then you are fine. So just as long as you're able to submit documentation that we need in order to determine the medical necessity, then that's all we're asking for. We're not being specific as to, well, was it face-to-face? -face? Was it teletherapy? Was it telephonic? Was it this, that, or the other? We just need to know that the information and we need that it's in the record that you're sending to us. So I hope that answers the question. I think I, th I think it is as far as I understood the question. Um, so we also this is a good question. I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, so what do you recommend? Uh, what do you recommend that we track and gather information that may be helpful to determine if this will be a possible platform in the future? for all of our senior care members. Um, so we, I will say too that Melody and I and everyone at the Healthcare Authority have been looking at this in terms of, um, you know, mother is a lot of times a necessity of all 
invention and innovation. And so I would say that we are going to evaluate this uh, once the emergency period is over and look at the utilization and look at outcomes. Uh, I would say that things that our providers could do to kind of track that is, um, as you, you should be doing, is just touching base with your clients uh, that you're providing this service, uh, kind of get their uh, feedback on how, how they liked it. If you feel like the services um, can be safely, effectively performed by telehealth, that could be a way that we can especially help our, our rural members, uh, even moving forward past the emergency period. But we are, we will look at all that internally, but I would say yes, any anecdotal information or data you can uh, collect on your end as well would be helpful. So we have a question about, uh, uh, several questions about SLPs. Uh, can SLPs do evals per telehealth and bill for that service? Uh, so I will say as far as evaluations, no, that's currently not a service that we've opened up uh, for reimbursement by telehealth. But for other services that, a, that an SLP could do, uh, Jacqueline, have we also opened those up to the GT modifier reimbursement as well? Yes, we have. Okay. So a follow-up to that, um, did I just hear that you want to reimburse OT and SP uh, evals? I have received approval for speech eval with the G code, so I assume it'll be in re reimbursed. Is that not correct? Hmm. Which particular code, I guess I could ask, which particular code are, did you bill on that one, I guess? I would respond to that. Yeah, and that's coming from Melissa Shaw. Melissa, I would also say maybe if you want to email that particular PA number or ICN to Jacqueline, we can we can look further into that. So there are certain questions around speech evals. Again, I would I would refer to uh, Jacqueline's earlier comment that there are certain speech uh, codes that have always been open for telehealth reimbursement that have not been added recently, but have been around for the last couple of years. So it's possible that some of these uh, services have already been reimbursed by telehealth. And looking at the questions, there's going to be some that we'll need to we'll put in writing. That would be best answered in writing, so we have a comprehensive response that staff would be able to contribute to. So there's a question: Will the meeting be available at a later date as a download to review the speaking points? Yes, we're actually recording today's session, so we will post this to our. Uh, COVID-19 website or webpage, uh, as well as the question and answers from today's session. So where will we be able to find those answers to the question that have been asked? So that will be on our okhda.org slash COVID-19 uh, webpage. Uh, we'll create links at the bottom of the page where we currently have these webinars announced right now. Uh, we'll have links to those two days uh, within the next few days. Um, so Jacqueline, as I am going to wrap up the meeting, but I want individuals who haven't had a chance to ask a question yet to be able to submit some of these specific code-based reimbursement and PA questions. Uh, can you reiterate again what those email addresses are to send those to? Yes. Let me get back there. 
Okay, so the for MAU, just in general, it's M-A-U admin, A-D-M-I-N at O-K-H-C-A dot org. And then the one specific to therapy, this is PTOT and speech, is therapy, so T-H-E-R-A-P-Y, admin, A-D-M-I-N, at O-K-H-C-A dot org. Thank you for that. So to reiterate, every question that's been submitted today through the Q&A function, we will download and respond to and then post those Q&As to our uh, COVID response webpage. Um, and if you weren't able to get a question in uh, or you don't feel it was adequately answered, uh, submit it to the therapy admin uh, mailbox and we'll do our best to get, um, add those to this Q&A as well. All right, I'll kick it back to Melody. Do you want to wrap us up? Well, thank you all very much, Trailer and Jacqueline and everyone who participated. Um, we will be more than happy to do a repeat of this provider anytime you feel like you need more clarification. This is not just the one time for our PT and OT and speech providers, but, but do realize that if you have some suggestions on changes to our delivery system via telehealth, you will notice uh, if you listen to the governor that uh, telemedicine in rural Oklahoma is a very special initiative for him moving forward. So we are open to any suggestions that you might have in order to serve as many people across the state as we possibly can. So thank you very much again for joining us today.